Okay, we said we were going to try question 7.26D next. And we've got a benzylic halogen, don't we? Or a benzylic halide because the chlorine is at the benzylic position. So we'll call this a benzylic. Um, what did we just say? Benzylic leaving group. And so the first step is going to be a loss of leaving group. How do I know that? It's a tertiary substrate and it's benzylic. Therefore, it's not going to undergo an SN2 reaction, and I'm not in a strong base. Therefore, my only possibility is going to be an SN1 or an E1 reaction, and we're going to get both occurring at the same, same time. So let's draw the loss of leaving group, and let's draw the resulting carbocation. Maybe we'll do the SN1 first this time. And here's my carbocation, which is benzylic, and you could draw all the resonance structures if you want. I'm going to not do that right now. But what's interesting about this is that you see that we went from a chiral center that is sp3 hybridized to an sp2 hybridized carbon, and that is achiral. So what that means is that my nucleophile, the methanol, can come in and it can attack from either face of the molecule. So that means that when I draw the product of the substitution, the methanol can be drawn on a dash or a wedge. I can get attacked from either side. Again, what I'm saying is this. The methanol, son of a gun. The methanol, let me draw some lone pairs in here, can attack from the back face of the molecule or it could attack from the front face of the molecule. So let's draw the products that we would get. We would get this where we have, let's put the, put it coming out in the front. So we'll put our wedge here and then I'm drawing the product of both steps, the nucleophilic attack and the proton transfer. So we would have this, plus we would have, it's an antiomer. Just have to reverse that stereo center. I'm gonna draw it out, why not? So we would end up with these two compounds that are enantiomers, enantiomers. Okay, so besides these two compounds, we're also gonna get some E1 products, right? These are the product of the SN1 reaction. So I'm going to redraw the carbocation down here. Draw the carbocation a second time. So it looks like, oops, it looks like this. So how many beta protons do I have? Well, I have this beta proton. If I was to pull this one off, I end up with a double bond here. So let's draw that product first. So I'll draw it in red just to color code it. If I pull off that red proton, I end up with this alkene. Oh, maybe you can draw it a little better than that. Like this. And there's no cis or trans to worry about since I have a methylene here, a CH2. There's no cis or trans. However, at this beta position, I have two protons. So I'll draw one in black and one in blue. And in this case, if I form a double bond here, I can get both cis and trans. So I'm going to draw them both. I'll put, uh, do this one first. So where we have the double bond like this. So this would be the trans compound. And then I'm going to draw the cis compound. So plus, uh, yeah. Sorry, that's not a trans compound. That's a cis compound. Mr. Dion. What are you doing? Here we go. So this is, since both methyls are on the same side, this is the cis compound, but this compound is also an E compound. There we go. I think that's what I was thinking of. There we go. And then we're also going to get this compound. But the methyl is going down like this. So this compound is trans, and it is also the Z compound. And so we end up with five different products. We end up with both of these enantiomers from the SN1. And then from the E1, we end up with two regioisomers. And of those two regioisomers, the Zaitsev produces two stereoisomers. And, and if you're wondering, do I have to be able to identify all those products? The answer is yes, you would have to be able to identify all those products. Now, if you need some more practice where it goes through these kind of problems in a step-by-step -step approach to solving it, you could go to the solutions manual which I hope you've purchased at this point, it will really take you step by step by step through each, each step along the way. 
And after all that information, luckily our textbook kind of takes a little bit of a breather. Let me just go down, find the section, which is down, oops, down here. Keep going, where was I? Yeah, section 7.9, which kind of rehashes a lot of what we've learned and just what the strategy would be that you would take. If you're overwhelmed and it's normal for people to be overwhelmed by all the things that we didn't see in organic chemistry, um, but hopefully you've taken away that there's a whole bunch of things that come into play. There's a number of factors we have to consider when we're determining what the products are of a reaction. We have to consider the substrate, our alkyl halide, we've got to consider the nucleophile, the solvent, all of these things have to be taken into account. And so it should be clear that in many cases, you end up with a mixture of substitution and elimination products. For example, here we have a secondary alkyl halide, we have a strong base, strong nucleophile, thus we're going to get SN2 and E2. The E2 will predominate in this case because the secondary alkyl halide is um, sterically hindered, but uh, we get a mixture of both the Zaitsev product, the Hoffman product, and the substitution product, which occurs via inversion of configuration. So we'd have to be able to look at that and determine what the products would be there. Um, and there are situations where you're going to get only one product. Okay, let's say you have this reaction. You've got a tertiary alkyl halide, and you're using a strong base, strong nucleophile. Well, Methoxide is not going to act as a nucleophile on a tertiary substrate. However, it can pull off a beta proton, can't it? It can pull off this beta proton, no problem, to do an elimination reaction and form an alkene. And so in order to understand how to use these reactions to transform alkyl halides into a compound, you've got to be able to predict all the products that will form, as well as the major and minor products. So what's you know, if you're wondering, is there a stepwise approach I could take? This is the stepwise approach laid uh, for, or laid out, I should say, by the author of our textbook, Dr. Klein. He says, well, you know, first I would look at the reagent. Say, is this a strong base, a strong nucleophile, weak base, weak nucleophile? Then I would look at the substrate. Is this primary, secondary, tertiary methyl? Is it benzylic? Is it allylic? Then say, okay, well, I'm going to get this mechanism, and then you have to consider regiochemistry. Am I going to get the Zaitsev? Am I going to get the Hoffman? Which one is major? Which one is minor? Am I getting uh, the stereochemical requirements? Is this going to be stereospecific, stereoselective? Am I going to get the E predominating, the Z? Those kinds of things. And so if you're wondering, do you have it in a, in a table? Sure. This is a table that shows you all the strong bases, all the weak bases, the strong nucleophiles, and the weak nucleophiles. So if you have an SN2 reaction, that's going to happen when we have a strong nucleophile, whereas if you have an SN1, that's going to predominate when we have a weak nucleophile. Strong bases are going to promote E2, and weak bases are going to promote E1. And so this table is really great for categorizing reagents uh, and the mechanisms that they're going to promote. We look at all the strong bases that are strong nucleophiles, hydroxide, methoxide, ethoxide, all these guys right here, right? They're all negatively charged, so they're all uh, really good um, nucleophiles. And then they're great bases because they're the conjugate base of weak acids, right? The conjugate acid of this is water, methanol, ethanol. Those are all weak acids, so these are all strong bases. Whereas if you look at strong nucleophiles that are weak bases, they either have a negative charge, like all of these, or involve a sulfur, which is very polarizable. So that makes them all good nucleophiles or strong nucleophiles, but they're weak bases. Why? Because they're the conjugates of strong acids, right? Hydro, HI, HBr, HCl, um, a thiol, um, uh, dihydrogen sulfide. These are all uh, strong acids or stronger, and so these are all good nucleophiles. Now, moving on to the last category, weak bases, weak nucleophiles, that's going to be any alcohol like ethanol or methanol or water, right? We don't think of water as being a strong base. It's weak, and it's also a weak nucleophile. So that brings me to the far left over here, and there's a couple of bases that we haven't talked about yet. So strong base, but a crummy nucleophile. Now, if you're wondering, 
hey, why wouldn't, if this is sodium hydride, why wouldn't hydride, I can see why that's a strong base, it's got a negative charge, but why wouldn't this make a good nucleophile? Why would that be a weak nucleophile? The reason why it's a poor nucleophile is because it's so small, it's not polarizable. It can't distort its electron cloud, and therefore it is a crummy nucleophile. DBU and DBN, these stand for diazobicyclonanine and diazobicycloandecane. Uh, we're going to talk about those in a little bit. I have their structures in the slides somewhere. So I'll come back to DBU and DBN. Actually, I don't think I do have those structures in the slides. So I'm going to ask you for the first time since you've been in this class, I'm going to ask you to read, read this in textbook. Okay, I'm going to ask you to read about DBU and DBN, which are covered in Chapter 7. The bottom line is that these are acronyms for two other bases. I'm never going to ask you to draw them. I'll ask you to be able to recognize that you, this is either DBU or DBN. They have very, uh, very e recognizable structures. And all you need to know is that they represent strong bases that are weak nucleophiles. So now that we've categorized strong bases, weak bases, strong nucleophiles, weak nucleophiles, we can analyze those in terms of the substrate and what's going to happen. If you have a strong base weak nucleophile, like sodium hydride, DBU, or DBN, those are not going to do any kind of substitution reactions because they're just non-nucleophilic, but they're very strong bases, and so they're going to form the products of E2 reactions, whether we're reacting them with um, primary, secondary, or tertiary substrates. When we get into strong base, strong nucleophile, like hydroxide, methoxide, or ethoxide, if you have a primary substrate, well, in that case, it's so unhindered that SN2 will predominate, but you will get a little bit of E2. Whereas once you move to a secondary substrate, then the alkyl halide becomes so sterically hindered that it's actually elimination that predominates and you only get a little bit of substitution. Whereas if you have a tertiary substrate, it's so sterically hindered that the only thing that can happen is elimination. When we get to the weak base strong nucleophile, of which there are many, iodide, bromide, chloride, a thiolate, uh, a hydrosulfide ion, um, thiols, uh, H2S, okay, these are where um, a substitution is going to predominate, right? Because they're such good nucleophiles, but they're non-basic, the SN2 is going to predominate for a primary and secondary, but a tertiary, again, is so hindered that we're only going to get SN1. And the last one is the weak base, weak nucleophile. That would be something like water, methanol, or ethanol. And as we just saw a few minutes ago, we get SN1 and E1 only with tertiary or benzylic, benzylic and allylic um, halides, and we get mixtures, right? We have to take into account stereochemistry. For the SN1, do we get inversion and retention of configuration? For E1, do we get regioisomers? Do we get um, Hoffman? and Zaitsev products, right? Do we get different stereoisomers? So that is kind of the decision tree you have to make. Now, what students will usually come at me with after looking at this table and this table, they'll ask me, do I have to memorize this table? You cannot bring this table into an exam. And so I would reckon, I would say, I wouldn't use the word memorize. I would put familiarize familiarize yourself with this table. All that got deleted. Familiarize yourself with this table. Let's rehash. Strong base, strong nucleophile. Sodium hydride, DBU, DBN, DBN. Strong base, strong nucleophile. That would be hydroxide, methoxide, ethoxide. We had a whole holy host of weak bases that were good nucleophiles, like these. Uh, there we go, thiols, oops, H2S. Nope, not H2O, H2, 
S. And then over here we had what water, methanol, and ethanol. Okay, I would say familiarize yourself with this table to the point that you borderline memorize it. Now, why do I say borderline memorize it? Because there are exceptions to everything that's on here. Just this isn't, you know, Moses didn't come down from Mount Sinai with this table. Um, it is just something that we put together, and there are some exceptions. So let's say you have a hindered base. Like I'd say one notable exception would be this one right here. If you have a primary alkyl halide, but you have T-butoxide, right? If you're using potassium T-butoxide, then E2 would predominate in that case to the point where you'd get, you know, next to no or little substitution, I would say. Uh, but anyhow, that's enough about that. So what do we do? We analyze the reagent and we decide what's the product going to look like. What's our regioisomer, our stereoisomers, et cetera. For SN2, um, you only get inversion of configuration. So that one's pretty quick. Uh, for E2, you draw all the possible isomers. You get Zaitsev, you get Hoffman. For an SN1 reaction, I would always start by drawing the carbocation and consider if it's going to undergo a rearrangement. You're going to get some retention, some inversion of configuration. It says there's a slight preference for inversion over retention of configuration. And then for the E1 reaction, you've got to consider the Zaitsev, the Hoffman, and then stereochemistry, the trans and the cis, or the E and the Z, when that, um, when that is uh, pertinent. Now, you might be sitting there saying, well, Mr. Dion, you kind of blasted through those four slides faster than anything I've ever seen you do. The reason why I kind of blast through these is because this is the kind of thing I could sit here and yammer on about these slides for the next week. But the only way for you to master and understand this table and how to determine what the products are going to be is to practice it. So instead of us just talking about it, we've gone through everything already. And thus, I think the best thing for us to do would be to look at a couple of problems and say, well, what's going to happen here? Let's take a look. We've got a secondary alkyl halide and we've got a strong base, strong base, strong nucleophile, a hydroxide. This can act as a nucleophile or a base. Let's go back to the table. Let's go all the way back here. We've got a secondary alkyl halide. I'll use my green highlighter. It's secondary and I've got hydroxide. So what's going to happen is we're going to get mostly E2 products and we're going to get some SN2 product as well. Since it's SN2 and we've got a stereocenter where our leaving group is found, if we have the SN2 product, it's going to occur via inversion of configuration. And so you could start by drawing the SN2 product. If you want to practice the mechanism, right here's your hydroxide ion. It's going to do a nucleophilic attack. You're going to have the loss of leaving group and you get inversion of configuration. This wedge becomes a dash because it flips like an umbrella in the wind. So there you go. We get the SN2 product. Well, what about E2 products? If we go back here. I mean, look at how many beta protons we have. We have beta protons here and we have beta protons here. And in this case, we actually do have to consider cis and trans. And so there's three different elimination products we can form. If we pull off any one of these protons off of the methyl group, we're going to end up with this compound, where we have the double bond on the end. However, if we pull off HA, we're going to end up with the trans product. And if we pull off HB, we're going to end up with the cis product. So there's four different products that you end up forming in here. Now, again, what's the major product going to be? Well, the major pathway was E2. And if we examine all the E2 products, we see that these two are disubstituted. So those are more stable than this one. And then if we examine those two, we see that this one is the trans and it's more stable than the cis. And there you go. That's a lot of decision making, isn't it? We had to decide. Um, uh, we had to decide what mechanism is going to predominate. And we had to decide, you know, out of the predominant mechanism, which one would be the major product for all of those. All right. So that covers 
a lot of information about how you decide, you know, what's going to happen. But what I would recommend is that you familiarize yourself, not memorize, but familiarize yourself very well with this table and the information that I wrote on top of it right here. Okay, you want to be familiar with all that information. So somebody posted in the chat, you know, could you post um, extra, extra problems from chapter seven? Well, I can tell you right now that if you get through all of the practice problems in the book, all the practice problems that I assigned, which there are many, if you look into here, you go into the chapter seven module. So if we scroll down here to the chapter seven module, these are the suggested practice problems that I have from the book. So let's see if it'll open. You can see that there are many, many, many problems. This should be more than enough problems for anybody to be able to master the content. If you understand all the problems, I would say this would be more than enough. If you want to go and get a different book or suss out some different problems, you could do that. But I would say there is more than enough problems in here to master the content. In fact, there's a ton of problems in there. So with all that in mind, I just want to show you a couple more kind of, not nuances, but a few additional bits of information that you need to have about um, SN1 and E1 and SN2 and E2. But before we do that, why don't we try another practice problem and see if we can use that table to help us decide what the products will be of these reactions. So let's take a look. It says identify the major and minor products that are expected for each of these reactions. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. I'm going to ask my students, what kind of substrate do we have here with this bromine? Would this be primary, secondary, tertiary alkyl halide? Can anybody tell me? Absolutely, absolutely. This is secondary. So we'll pencil that in. It's a secondary alkyl halide, alkyl halide. Then if we look at the chloride, so we have sodium chloride, right? We have Na plus and Cl minus. So is chloride, what category would that be? Is this a strong base or a weak base? Chloride, can anybody tell me, is it a strong base or a weak base? Would chloride be a strong base or a weak base? Yes, it's a weak base, absolutely. So we've got a weak base, okay? And would chloride be considered a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? Definitely a strong nucleophile, isn't it? Strong, strong nucleophile. So if we go back to the table, scooch all the way back here. Bear with me. I rifle through my slides. Where are we? We are here. We have, oops, we have a secondary alkyl halide. And let me just delete this here. Now we've got chloride. So what's going to predominate? SN2, just SN2. Will SN2 proceed with inversion of configuration or retention of configuration? Could anybody answer that one? And again, there are no trick questions in organic chemistry. Inversion of configuration or retention of configuration for the SN2. So uh, if it's SN2, my nucleophilic attack and my loss of leaving group will occur simultaneously. And thus, it's going to give me inversion of configuration. So if one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm going to change my wedge to a dash. And now I've got my chloride over here. So this is SN2 only for this one. Any questions about that one? Any trick questions about that one? No? Okay, well, let's try the next one. The next one, and I'm not going to refer back to the table every time. You guys can go back and take a peek. But now we have a tertiary alkyl halide, so tertiary alkyl halide. And if I have t-butoxide, then it is a strong base. Okay, so we'll put here strong, strong base, but it's a poor nucleophile. 
poor nucleophile. Now, why would TV toxide be a poor nucleophile? Because if you have an electrophilic center, you can imagine that TV toxide is just so big and bulky that it can't, you know, get close enough to do a nucleophilic attack. It won't happen. Too big and bulky. However, it can pull off a beta proton. And what are the beta protons that we have here? Well, there's two types. There's these beta protons in red, the ones on the methyl groups, but we also have a beta proton here. And so what's going to predominate is going to be an E2 reaction. So we're going to get E2 only because we have a tertiary alkyl halide strong base, which is so big and bulky, it's a poor nucleophile. If we pull off the red proton, what we're going to end up with is something that will look like this. So we're going to end up with our double bond being right here. But if we pull off the blue proton, then we end up with something like this, like that. There we go. Could anybody tell me which one of these would be the major product? And again, there's no trick questions in organic chemistry. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The red one is going to be the major product. Oops, use my red pen maybe. This will be my major product. And we'll put here since base is hindered. Hindered. There we go. The last one, we have a benzylic halide. So we have a benzylic one. It's tertiary and benzylic. So tertiary slash benzylic. But we have DBN, which we saw was a strong base, strong base, um, weak nucleophile. So we're not going to get any substitution here, only elimination. There's only one kind of beta proton. It's this one here. And therefore, the only thing that can happen would be the E2 reaction only. So E2 only. And we're going to end up with this compound like that. So that's the only product you would get in that specific reaction. Okay, there we go. So why don't we take another short break and then we're going to come back and we're going to tackle section 7.10 which deals with other substrates. So not we're not always going to be looking at alkyl halides. Sometimes we look at alkyl sulfonates, and a sulfonate is a good, a good leaving group. And if you're wondering, well, why do I have to learn another leaving group? There's a good reason for that, and we'll get into that once we discuss this.